Today's message is titled, What is Your Response to Christmas? Part 2. Last Sunday, we covered the responses of Mary, uh, the shepherds, the host of angels, Simeon, the wise men, and King Herod. Today, we'll look at the responses of Joseph, a little godly family made up of Zacharias, Elizabeth, and baby John the Baptist. And last but not least, we'll take a look at Anna, a humble prophetess. This was a a very elderly woman who was sold out to God. Well, the sixth response is Joseph. So let us read here Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Matthew 1, 18 to 25. Joseph, as you know, is the who will soon be the husband of Mary and who is the stepfather of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Matthew chapter 1. We're going to take a, a look at his response to Christmas or to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 1, 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you, Mary, your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her, did not have sexual intercourse, that is, till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. First things first, Joseph was a just man, which basically means that Joseph was a genuine believer, a righteous man, a man who loved and obeyed God's Old Testament word. Genesis 6, 9 says that Noah was a just man. It says here, Noah, a just man who was perfect in his generation and walked with God. The same would be true of Joseph. By the way, to say that someone is walking with God means that a person is walking in step with the word of God. So anyone who makes the Bible their path, honestly and genuinely and sincerely, is walking with God. Well, this was, this was Joseph's character. He was a genuine believer. And in his days, there were many fake believers. It wasn't so with Joseph. Because of Joseph's godly character and merciful heart, he decided to secretly break off the engagement and not make her a public example which means that Joseph chose not to have Mary stoned to death by the public, which was the capital punishment for women who cheat on their husbands found in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 23 and 24. Let's read that. Deuteronomy 22, 23 and 24. If a young woman who is a virgin is betrothed to a husband, and a man finds her in the city and lies with her, then you shall bring them both out to the gate of that city, and you shall stone them to death with stones. 
the young woman, because she did not cry out in the city, and the man, because he humbled his neighbor's wife. So you shall put away the evil from among you. I believe that Joseph knew this. He had two choices. He can let her go, or he can bring her to public shame and have her stoned to death. This is, this is what he was wrestling with. And yet the Bible says that he chose to show mercy, which shows you what kind of character this man was. Keep in mind that at this point, again, Joseph was engaged to marry, which means that they were pra practically married in the Jewish culture. And that's the reason why it says that he chose to put her away, which means to legally divorce her. You see, in the Jewish culture, when you were uh, betrothed or engaged, it was as though you were already married. That's how serious the commitment was even before finalizing the marriage. But it was at this time when he was engaged to Mary, when Mary told Joseph about her heavenly and miraculous pregnancy. Mary no doubt told Joseph about her awesome encounter with the angel Gabriel, and what he had said to her, recorded in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 37. I'm sure she told Joseph, Joseph, an angel told me that I was the highly favored one and blessed among women. I'm sure she also told him that the angel said I was to give birth to a son, Jesus, the son of the highest. She also told him that the Holy Spirit would overshadow her in order for her to give birth to the Son of God. And how she told the angel, how can this be since I don't know a man? In other words, I'm a, I'm a virgin. How is this possible? What was Joseph's response to Christmas? It was disbelief. Possibly, most likely, discouraged Angry, confused, can you blame the guy? After all, his fiance was pregnant and not by him. What is he to do? Call the Maury Povich show or Jerry Springer to get to the bottom of this? What is Joseph to do? At first, I wouldn't doubt if Joseph thought that Mary was missing some screws. I can hear Joseph now. An angel visit you, Mary? Seriously? And you are giving birth to who again? The son of the highest? God's son, Mary? And you expect me to believe that, Mary? Stop talking crazy, woman. You think I'm dumb or something? Just tell me the truth. Who did you cheat on me with? It must have been pretty intense at first. Joseph was confused. He wasn't sure if Mary was telling the truth. It was too hard to believe. Joseph disbelieved until God gave him more light, more info on the matter through an angel. Joseph was reminded of Isaiah 7, 14, which was crucial it was the key verse for Joseph. Joseph needed to hear Isaiah 7, 14. And it says, behold, which points to something marvelous, like marvel. The virgin will bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Well, that's what Joseph needed to hear. At that point, he realized that it was his Mary who was the virgin that Isaiah 7, 14 was talking about. It was a miraculous conception. Keep in mind that Joseph was a lover of God's word. And this foretold promise by the prophet Isaiah coming from an angel's lips was all he needed to hear. Listen, there are going to be times when there are individual passages in the Bible that are going to play a significant role in your life in a specific situation. That's God's word for you. 
God gives us what we need to hear. And this is exactly, exactly what Joseph needed to hear. Nothing more and nothing less. But that this situation was Isaiah 714 being fulfilled. Behold, a virgin will bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. So this too is his response after he got a little more light. Joseph finalized his marriage with Mary. He didn't have sexual intercourse with her until Jesus was born. And he named God's son Jesus. Listen, obedience is always the response of true faith. Today, many respond to Christmas like Joseph at first. Many respond, many respond to the birth of Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, with doubt, suspicion, and speculation until God gives them more light about Jesus through His Word. I'm convinced that there are many churches in our day where people are sitting in the pews and because they're not given more light, sufficient light, ongoing light, they're not able to believe unto salvation or to grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph was given more light that helped him believe. Lastly, many atheists ridicule Christmas because of the miracle of the virgin birth. Listen, in part, I believe that God chose for his son to be conceived in this miraculous way to make it, listen, difficult for the proud of heart to believe. This is one way in which God uses what is considered foolish things to confound the wise, to stun and confuse the wise. God chose to use miracles in order to make it difficult for people, proud people, to believe and be saved. The Bible says, unless you come as a child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And by the way, many have a hard time believing the virgin birth. I think it's harder to believe that the earth is hanging on nothing. And yet we know that's a fact. Seventh, we have baby JB, John the Baptist. Let us read Luke chapter 1. Verses 39 to 35. Luke 1. Thirty-nine to thirty-five. We're going to see Elizabeth's response as well because it's mixed in there. But let's take a look at John the Baptist first. Thirty-nine. Now Mary arose in those days went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why? Is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. What a beautiful response. How did baby Johnny respond to Christmas? Verse 41, it says, It happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe, this is Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, leaped in her womb. Verse 44 says, The babe, John the Baptist, leaped in my womb for joy. Here we have a six-month-old unborn baby leaping due to the nearness of baby Jesus in Mary's womb. 
And many say that life isn't valuable in the womb. Little Johnny here proves them wrong. Looks like an unborn ba baby has more sense than pro-abortionist. Listen, if you ever forget how valuable unborn life is, remember this scene. If anyone ever comes to you and asks you about abortion or some counsel regarding that issue, take them to this passage and show them that the prophet, the greatest prophet of all, the, the forerunner of the son of the highest, leaped in his mother's womb at six months old with joy. Unborn babies are joyful. Also, you can take them to Psalm 139. It explains how valuable life is in and out of the womb. Eighth, we have Elizabeth. Elizabeth shouts, blessed is the fruit of your womb. She recognizes that God's divine hand of blessing is upon Mary. The fruit of her womb is the Messiah. Blessed is the Messiah who is in your womb. Elizabeth also says, But why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Do you hear the humility in her voice? This, this is true humility and pure gratitude 101. In other words, Elizabeth was saying, Who am I? I'm just a nobody. Elizabeth senses her unworthiness as she's, in a sense, being visited by her unborn Savior. This is how Christmas ought to make everyone feel. We are unworthy of the Savior's visit, let alone the Savior's death in our place. Notice she says, the mother of my Lord. She makes it very personal. The mother of my Lord. The word Lord in Greek is Kurios, which means supreme authority, divine, God, Lord, Master. Elizabeth views unborn baby Jesus as her God, as Yahweh the Son, as her commander-in-chief. Anyone who doesn't truly view Jesus as Lord and fully submit to his Lordship has not responded to Christmas properly. Notice she makes this very personal by saying again, my Lord. In other words, she's saying he's the one that's going to save me, rescue me, tell me what to do, tell me how to live. He's got supreme authority over my life. Eventually, Doubting Thomas got it when he saw the resurrected Jesus and said, my Lord and my God. Elizabeth saw Jesus in this way even before he was born. Pretty awesome. She couldn't even see him and she knew him as Lord. Thomas had to see him resurrected before he could see him as Lord. Ninth, we have Zacharias. Let us read Luke chapter 1, verse 69 to 67 to 79. Luke 1. 67 to 79. Zacharias mainly speaks of Jesus when he refers. Then he refers to his son, John, from verses 76 to 79. At this point, John the Baptist is now eight days old. And Zechariah, his dad, has a few Holy Spirit filled words to say about Jesus and his son, John. So let us read here. Now his father, Zacharias, as the father of John the Baptist, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed is the Lord, God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us. In the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have, made, who have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant 
the oath which he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And you, now he's referring to his son, baby Johnny, the prophet, you, child, only eight days old here, will be called the prophet of the highest. For you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. In other words, you will go before God himself to prepare his way. Speaking of Jesus, 77, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God with which the day spring from on high was visited us. With which the day spring from on high has visited us. 79. To give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. To guide our feet in the way of peace. So the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the desert to the day of his manifestation to Israel. Speaking of, again, John the Baptist. What was Zechariah's response to Christmas? To the soon birth of the Messiah? Seeing that Mary stayed at his, at his and Elizabeth's house for three months, Zechariah was well aware that the Messiah was being formed in Mary's womb. Zechariah says, Blessed is the Lord, God of Israel, for he has visited us and redeemed his people, and raised up a horn of salvation. Pretty amazing. He recognizes who Jesus is. He understands that this was the long-awaited promise being fulfilled right before his very eyes and in his lifetime. And he had Mary, the mother of Jesus, who was, con who was pregnant with Christ in his home for three months. Imagine what that must have been like. I would have had Mary sit there under a tree and I would have sat there with her playing my guitar, worshiping the Lord, saying, Mary, don't move from here. Knowing that the, the God of the universe is under your roof for three months is amazing. But he says here again, blessed is the Lord God of Israel who has visited us. Zechariah saw the baby Jesus in Mary's womb as a visit from Yahweh himself. Did you catch that? Zacharias saw the baby Jesus in Mary's womb as a visit from Yahweh himself. He says, the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us. He also sees Jesus as the horn or the strength of salvation, as the Savior he saw Jesus as the promised one who would redeem, who would save, who would deliver and give abundant light to all who are lost in darkness. He saw Jesus as the morning sunrise. He calls him the day spring, which means the dawn, the light of the world. He saw Jesus as the great luminary. The great luminary. The sun, S-U-N, of righteousness. He saw Jesus as the sun that dawns on the earth and disperses darkness, especially the fear of death from the hearts of men. Jesus was the great light in our solar system, if you will. And his boy, John, was a little star in the background, but Jesus was the big, bright, blazing light of the world. Then Zechariah says of his eight day old little John, and you child will be called the prophet of the highest. Zechariah viewed Jesus as the highest, as John would be his forerunner. Zechariah basically said that Jesus came so that we, verse 74b, that we might serve the Lord without fear. Without fear, without the fear of death, without the fear of our enemies. Now I know that he's pointing to also a future prophecy when Jesus would reign on earth for 1,000 years. All of Jesus' enemies would be under, their feet, under his feet. 
all of Israel's enemies will be submitted. They will be able to serve the Lord without fear, without any other nation coming through like the Babylonians. But it's now for us here to serve the Lord without fear. In verse 75, it says, In holiness, that is to say that we are set apart from this world and set apart unto God, holy, not living unclean lives, living pure lives inside and out. It says, and righteousness, that is practical righteousness, living upright in the sight of God here before Him all the days of our life. Jesus has come to help us live our entire life here and now and forevermore for God. That's what Zacharias understood. Jesus has come to make us fearless, genuine servants and worshipers of God as He comes to live inside of us by faith. Jesus lives in us so that we, we would live holy and righteous before him all the days of our life. Not perfect lives, but lives that are growing and maturing with every passing day. One commentator writes, Zacharias didn't even know Jesus yet, but he praised him. He loved him. And he was passionate about Jesus. We know so much about Jesus. We know so much more about Jesus than Zacharias did. So what can excuse the coldness of our hearts? In other words, the commentator is saying we have no excuses. And that we ought to love the Lord Jesus even more than Zacharias because we know more. We've been given more light. At the moment, he knows more. He's in glory. His soul is in glory. But we have all 66 books. We have the life and the ministry of Jesus recorded. And in a sense, we know more. And so we have no excuse. We ought to be on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. Our hearts should be overjoyed. We should be passionate and devoted. We should have a holy ambition for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to conclude with our tenth response, tenth, we have Anna. Let us read Luke chapter 2, verse 36 to 38. Luke 2, 36 to 38. Here we have a super devoted, widowed elderly sister on the scene of Jesus' circumcision and dedication to the Lord. Let's read. Now there was one. Let's stop for a moment there. There was one. Luke is saying here that Anna was one of a kind. She was a diamond in the rough. She was a needle in a haystack. Now there was one. It's like saying there is, there is no one else like Anna. By the way, Anna means grace. It says... There, now there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Pinuel. You can also translate that Pinuel or Pinuel, which means face of God. It says, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, when Jesus was being dedicated to the Lord, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. This was her response. Now, if you do the math, this sister had to be about 103, 4, 5 years old. Because she had to be at least 14 plus to be married. She was married for 7 years when her husband died. She was widowed for 84 years. She is at least a century old. She was knowledgeable in Old Testament scripture. And she was a real prayer warrior. I'm telling you, she was more devoted than all of us put together. 
She served the Lord with fastings and prayers day and night. In a sense, she rented a room in the temple. She loved God so much she had to live in his presence. That's what the temple represented, by the way. Who says anyone is too old to be used by God? Listen, old age means nothing to God. It's a devoted and useful vessel that he is looking for. Because there are some that say, well, I'm too old to be used by God. You're never too old. Prayer and devotion and fasting transcends our wasting bodies. The pain and the aches that we have don't and can't stop us from seeking the Lord. Anna was devoted, extremely devoted. How did Anna respond to Christmas? Well, we know. How did she respond to Jesus' birth? Verse 38 says, she gave thanks. I would have you know that you and I ought to be the most thankful people in all the planet. We have Christ. And don't tell me that you're thankful if you're living in disobedience. Because obedience is the fruit of true gratefulness and thankfulness unto the Lord. She gave thanks. When was the last time you gave thanks to God sincerely from the heart for what he has done by giving us a provision for salvation in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the one who took our place in order that we might be saved? He took our punishment on the cross. She recognizes this. She recognizes that the promise is fulfilled. She gives thanks to the Lord. She recognizes that one has come to wash away her sins. She gives thanks to the Lord. And it says here, and she spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. She proclaimed Jesus' birth to all who would hear, to all who looked and anticipated God's redemption. At this moment, I wouldn't doubt that the temple courtyard was filled with people. She must have ran out there with excitement and joy and began to proclaim that the Savior is here. The promised seed, the promised Messiah. Yahweh the Son is in our midst. He's in that building right there in the temple. In the arms of Simeon, I saw him with my own eyes. May we respond like Anna, with a thankful heart and a megaphone to our lips, telling anyone who would listen about Jesus and his power to save. To tell people about his person, about his work, about his teachings, to tell people about his greatness, about his beauty, about his mercy, and even about his wrath that is coming, to warn people. And so I pray that you were blessed today by the message, and may we take these responses to heart, and again examine our own hearts and be honest and say, how have we responded? If you reject Jesus, You reject eternal life. If you receive the Lord Jesus, follow the Lord Jesus, love the Lord Jesus, obey the Lord Jesus, you will be given eternal life. Father, I pray that we would be of those who responded properly to Christmas, to the birth of Christ. That we would be filled with joy for who you are and what you've done for us. We celebrate you, Lord. You are the greatest gift ever given to man. Gadgets, things, stuff, those are nice, but they won't last. You have given us your son, the ultimate gift that lasts forever. The gift that keeps on giving throughout all eternity. And you didn't put him under a tree. You nailed him to a tree in our place. And we just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you for your son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.